MSNBC was just so focused on like the social, it's because of socialism. Socialism is why we lost down ballot. You know, all these people that, that lost down ballot, well, not all of them, but the theme was neoliberalism. It was working with Republicans. It was appealing to the center. And what did the center do? The center voted against Trump, but then voted for the Republicans down ballot. Well, yeah. Um, for me, $15 minimum wage, which, sorry, I have to say that. It, well, also, um, a lot of progressive ballot measures all over the country, like New Jersey legalized marijuana, Oregon legalized all drugs, no, not legalized, decriminalized Decriminal. possession. So what I think is that with MSNBC, they just actually rant um, what they want to be the truth. For example, I believe that Arizona had a lot of to do with the fact that we have a strong um, coalition of um, organizations that do that work for on behalf of immigration and Latinos and that kind of organizing that's been done for the past four years. Mm -hmm. But yet on MSNBC, they said it must be Cindy McCain's endorsement. Oh, and yeah. it's like, no, it is. So what I see is that there's a disconnect because they want it to be one thing. Right. They want American people to not want base. I wouldn't even call it socialism, but just basic human needs. And that's what they're hearing in their bubbles. And they're actually doing no data analysis because if you looked at somebody, there was a Twitter where somebody put all these screenshots on Fox News polls. Yeah. Socialized medicine was at 70%. Um, Green New Deal was at 60 something. So it's not a data analysis as much as a narrative building analysis. And that in Arizona, uh, you know, that too. Um, Prop 208 to, to fund uh, public schools in a, in a state that is a right to work state where where public school teachers are making $35,000 a year. I don't know how you live in Phoenix, Arizona, fifth largest city in the country uh, off of $35,000 a year. I have friends who have three, four kids and they're two teachers in their household and, and they're not making an, it's just, it's, it's too much. It's too much. And so that wasn't a Cindy McCain <laughs> no. endorsement that passed that. Um, I mean, okay, so, so let's go back to history real quick. All right, we're, we're, we don't have the press, uh, the working class press. Uh, what, what could we be, what, what are we repeating right now? What are we doing that like, cause I really think we gotta sharpen up. Like this is the moment uh -oh. from now until inauguration, like get focused people. We don't, I mean, I live in Astoria. We don't, the country is not Astoria, which is good. Like it doesn't, there's a lot of things there, right? It's not because we don't understand rural. It's because we have to understand how to win. We don't have enemies in Astoria that are trying to, you know, uh, it, it, we do. I mean, the Democratic Party is not necessarily that that great, um, but it's not the same. It's I not the same. Agree. Um, another thing we're missing is the very strong militant union movement. I have a really funny story from 1912, where back then it was illegal and bosses would actually ha hire Pinkertons or people with actual guns to shoot people who unionized. So it was dangerous. Yeah. So what two union organizers who were super smart did was that they played the good cop, bad cop. So one guy went in and infiltrated the workshop as like a pro boss laborer, and then the other guy would ask all the laborers, do you want to unionize? And then if he said no, then he would say, oh, this guy is pro-union and get all the anti-union people fired. And eventually in 1912, like they got unionized with 3000 workers and they got minimum wage. They actually got paid in wages. And so it's hard. I know what they're doing is that now that we're working remotely via Zoom, you're not going to be able to have those kitchen conversations with your colleagues. So we have the lowest union rate and collective bargaining is one of the first ways, I guess it's like a school on direct action mm -hmm. and how to cooperate, what to like, I mean, before the workers go to the boss with their demands, there's so much organization. Like they all have to sit together and decide what they want and what they want to demand, what they want to wait on, how to negotiate. There's so much. And we don't have any unions. We have gig workers and who are in, I don't know what independent, like it's non-sustainable. They're not employees. They're not 
getting any benefits. They're barely making ends meet. And it's harder to unionize because you don't, you, you don't meet your colleagues. And that's the second second part that we are completely missing. And the third one is, of course, in the 1930s, we had unemployment councils that had millions and millions of people. So it's like a union for the unemployed. And that really helped push the works project program and the new deal because these unemployed people were together in a block and they would tell the mayor, hey, we're not going to let you pass unless you cancel the evictions. Right. And so those are the three things we don't have. All right, lots of lots of uh, lessons and lots of, I mean, there's building that we just don't have, we, we're not able to because of, like you said, independent contractors. And of course this Prop 22 in, in California, which will now be law, makes it even harder to do so. Um, but we do have DSA. Um, and many people in DSA are union members and are part of the, the trade union movement. Uh, but it, it's also something that is not militant. Um, you know, it's an open membership. Uh, and, and as a result, sometimes the conversations, I mean, we have to be very conscious of like penetration. Like, are there folks that introduce conversations that distract us away from like the key important issues? I mean, I will start saying, listen, I'll start saying that now. Like, Sometimes I'm like, why are we talking about this when the immediate, like if we're really practicing our socialism in a Marxist way, we should be having conversations about what's materially, like what are our material crises and how do we get to the short, what is the shortest route in making sure that we protect the most vulnerable people in our community? And absolutely. And like I said, R tenants councils, collective action. 1930s, they had tenant councils that stopped, literally stopped evictions. And what I notice is at least from interviews is that sheriffs really don't want to be evicting old ladies. So just having a bunch of neighbors come together on the day of the eviction can make them less willing to just take that extra step with that little pressure. That's interesting. And so... Yeah, it's just that we don't understand that nothing individually that we do will work. We need to put collective pressure and sometimes collective pressure could be as simple as standing in front of the door of the old lady who's going to get evicted because of the crisis. Yeah, but I mean, but there's this there's, there's something that's a little bit more complex in this era is there okay you've been evicted and and now your credit's wrecked and now you can't get a new home when you do you know pick up your when you have a job again and i mean there's just the the, the complexities of this housing crisis in in new york in particular we're very familiar with it but across america we don't we're not even consciously understanding how how much the way that the the housing crisis of 2008 and earlier affected this economy, you know, this rental housing crisis is going to, I think, have just as much as a significant impact. Oh, absolutely. Um, some sources predict um, at least 30 million people are at risk of becoming evicted because of the COVID-related joblessness, and then they can't pay rent, and it ricochets from there. And what we do know is that a lot of... Uh, houses or at least mortgages are owned by bank banks right and for them it's actually nothing they don't have to foreclose but it's because they have some sort of procedure where they automatically send it to our like their in-house counsel who didn't like it's and actually with evictions you know what happens 90 percent of the time the tenant does not show up because they don't get the proper notification. And so the judge just, if, if, if there's two parties and one party doesn't show up, then it, the judge automatically rules on favor of the party that does show up. And so wow. a, a lot of times we can, uh, like a lot of times we can help by daily just looking up all the evictions in your neighborhood and telling your neighbors, hey, you're gonna be there. Like maybe you haven't gotten it in the mail. Maybe they didn't know, summon you properly. And so we actually need organizations that handle everything from a systemic way. So evictions are easy to look at, and but we need a way to have like a collective neighborhood watch on the evictions to see who's going to go. And then there are free legal aid services, but it's hard if you're getting evicted. So 
I, the only way I see it is by having massive collective action at whatever the level it makes sense, rental or like your building, building wise, level. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and without that, nothing's going to change. You're not going to get the legislator to change it because they don't care. And so we really have to think systemically and with evictions, especially, they're actually pretty easy. And the really interesting thing is I was speaking to, uh, do you know him, um, Russ Cirincioni? He, he ran for yes, um, yeah, yeah. Congress. Uh, yeah, he, he's an eviction, he's a good people's eviction lawyer. Uh, so he helps a lot of people. And for example, um, he says that in some places in New Jersey, they have set up an eviction court watch. And um, so that way, at least the first step is people who are poor knowing about their hearings to show up, which is half the battle. So it has so, to be done yeah. more than electorally. Asha, Asha Krishna Swami, did I say mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Check out her podcast, historically, historic.ly. Uh, it's a great podcast. You also have like a, a newsletter that you send out with it, which is really interesting, including photos and history. And I, I, I'm really, um, you know, I, I love, I love podcasts that go back in history. It's just a great way to kind of quickly absorb it all. Okay. By the way, quick correction. Um, yes. I can't afford the historically domain. It's so it's historically.substack.com. Sub Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> no worries. It's like, because it'll take you to a site and it says, buy this domain for $5,000. And I'm like, I can't afford it. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.